Matthew chapter 5. This is part 2 in a series that I've entitled 4. And I gave you the reason for the title of this series last week, that uh, I needed to fill four weeks worth of time before we launch into our new fall series through the book of Galatians that is tentatively titled Free at Last. Uh, And so as I was thinking about these four weeks that need to be filled, there were a whole host of reasons why the title four made sense. The first being that I need to fill four weeks. There will be a four-week series, and I don't have the creativity to come up with a new name right now, so I just called it four, okay? Um, it was actually Stacy's idea to call it four, so if you don't like it, blame her. Uh, but the other reason is because I wanted to look at four different passages from the Bible and show you, prove to you again and again and again and again, four times, that the Bible says one thing over and over and over again. And I've said in light of that, that it's the preacher's job not to say 10,000 different things, but to say one thing 10,000 different ways. And the reason that that's the job description of every preacher uh, is because that's what the Bible teaches, one thing over and over and over again. The Bible tells one story from Genesis to Revelation, and it points to one figure, the hero of every story, uh, namely Jesus. The Old Testament predicts God's rescuer, and the New Testament presents God's rescuer, but the entire Bible is built around this heroic figure of Jesus who um, God the Father sends to clean up the mess that we made. So this week, I want to look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, this is the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, a very well-known passage, often referred to to as the Beatitudes. But I want to read uh, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3 and reading down through verse 12. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3 and reading down through verse 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I want to begin with a quote from Martin Luther, my historical hero, my theological hero and my historical hero, uh, this is what he had to say about the Beatitudes. The infernal Satan has not found a single text in the scriptures that he has more shamefully distorted and into which he has imported more error and false teaching than this very passage. This really is the devil's masterpiece. I mean, that's, those are fighting words. I mean, he's talking about a section of the Bible. And of course, he's not calling into question the fact that this comes from God. Ultimately, what he's calling into question is the way this passage is so distorted, misinterpreted as to end up being a burden rather than a relief for all those who hear it. You see, we treat the Beatitudes as if they're all about us and the kinds of people we better become if we're going to be blessed by God. And it makes sense in one way uh, to understand it that way. Uh, I mean, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you want to get the kingdom of heaven, then you have to be poor in spirit. That's the way we read it. We read all of them that way. Um, we use them as a, as a measuring stick to compare levels of spiritual maturity. 
You need to grow in meekness. You need to grow in your hunger and thirst for righteousness. Uh, the more spiritually mature you are, the more poor in spirit you will become, and so on and so forth. We read them, in other words, prescriptively. And what I mean by that is that we read them as if, if we become like these things, then we will get the thing promised. It's the way we read them. So, for example, if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven, you better become poor in spirit. If you ever hope to see God, you better become pure in heart. If you want to inherit the earth, you better become meek, and so on and so forth. That's the way we typically read them. At least that's the way I used to read them, and that's the way they were always taught to me. In other words, those who get God's best are clearly those who have buckled down and mastered the Beatitudes. If you want God's best, you better get serious about mastering this list because it is only if you master this list you will be on the receiving end of the blessing that is promised. We handle the Beatitudes the same way we tend to handle the Ten Commandments, like they're a checklist of things we must do and the kinds of people we must become in order to get God's love. When we looked at the Ten Commandments for, I think, 11 weeks uh, back in the spring uh, in a series entitled Unmasked, that's one of the things we looked at very carefully and very closely that we typically handle the Ten Commandments like they're a ladder that we climb and the higher we get, the more of God's love and the more of God's blessing we receive. Well, that's the way we read the Beatitudes also. In fact, that's typically the way we read all of the Bible. But to read the Beatitudes as if they are prescribing a way to live is to misread them. The Beatitudes are not a to-do list set in a conditional context. This is what I mean by that. Jesus does not say, as he's preaching this sermon, he does not say, if you become poor, sad, meek, and pure, then you will have the kingdom, be comforted, inherit the earth, see God, and so on. He doesn't say that. We read this section conditionally because that's our default setting, but there are actually no conditions in this entire passage, not one. In fact, you will look in vain for the word if in these verses. Nowhere do these verses say, if you do this, then you'll get that. These are simply statements of fact. That's all he's doing here. That's all Jesus is announcing here. They are statements of fact. The Beatitudes are not prescriptive. Rather, they are descriptive. They're simply describing what sinners gripped by God's resurrecting grace get from God. That's all they're doing. Okay, he's, just, he's making an announcement. He's not prescribing anything. He's describing something. He's describing what sinners gripped by God's resurrecting grace get from God. They're simply statements of fact. So what he's saying is to those who know they are spiritually bereft, who mourn themselves as sinners, who know they lack righteousness, and so on and so forth, this is a comfort. This is a real comfort. Now, to those who think they are spiritually superior, strong, and righteous, this is a confronting list. To those who know they're weak, this is an announcement of hope. To those who think they're strong, this is an announcement of humiliation. This is good news to those who know they are weak and unrighteous. It's bad news to those who think they are strong and righteous. To those who think they are strong and righteous, they are on the wrong side of things, according to this list. Now, I say all that by way of introduction. Um, let me say this. How you hear the Beatitudes depends on where you're sitting when you hear them, okay? So, they sound different from on top than they do from the bottom, okay? They, they sound different up front than they do in the back. Up front with the self-sufficient and the self-assured, they sound pretty confrontational. In fact, they sound fairly condemning because if you're at the top 
and you've built your whole life around getting to the top, being strong and presenting a self-assured image and having everything under control and believing in yourself enough to manufacture the outcomes you desire and so on and so forth. Well, what this list tells you is you're on the wrong end of God's blessing. However, if you're at the bottom and you understand yourself to be bereft of any righteousness of your own, Uh, spiritually poor, meek, uh, aware that you're a sinner, uh, and that awareness brings about a humility and a meekness, Uh, someone who hungers and thirsts after righteousness because you know you don't have any of your own. If that's you, if you're flat on your back with no way out but up and you're feeling desperate and weak, well, I have good news for you, Jesus is saying. Um, The reason that these sound confrontational to the self-sufficient and the self-assured is because according to the canons of common sense, the wrong sorts of people are blessed here, okay? The exact opposite kinds of people are blessed by God, according to this list. Um, You know, the world has its own beatitudes, uh, a list of valuable qualities to celebrate. So, Uh, I had some fun yesterday flipping some of these around um, and looking at uh, the Beatitudes of our world, what I call the Bizarro Beatitudes. Remember Bizarro, Superman's alter ego, okay? Everything about him was backwards when he flew. He was all crooked. The S on his chest was crooked. He looked like Frankenstein. His cape was torn. You know, he was was the exact opposite of Superman, and his name was Bizarro, Uh, If you ever remember the Seinfeld episode uh, where Elaine encounters a bizarro world and she she has three friends like George, Kramer, and Jerry, but they're not George, Kramer, and Jerry. It's really funny. If you haven't seen it, you need to see it. Uh, If you have seen it, you know what I'm talking about, and it's a good inside joke, and we can be friends because we have the same sense of humor. Um, But the, the, the world has its own sort of Beatitudes, a a set of bizarro beatitudes, if you will. And so I had some fun yesterday um, looking. I had had, uh, made a list a while ago, and I kind of updated that list yesterday. Here are the beatitudes of our culture, of our world. Congratulations to the self-assured, for they will never doubt themselves. Congratulations to the strong, for they will never be defeated. Congratulations to the ambitious, for they get to the top. Congratulations to the self-righteous, for they are always right. Congratulations to the finger pointers, for they identify everything that's wrong. Congratulations to the merciless, for they are feared. Congratulations to those who don't get caught, for they look good. Congratulations to the aggressive, for they get to the front. Congratulations to the dogmatic, for they are never wrong. Congratulations to the expert, for they have no need to learn anything at all. Now, that's a sample list of what this world values and the kinds of people we are taught to become, the kinds of values we're taught to pursue. And if we can become these kinds of people, and if we can achieve these kinds of characteristics, then we will have our best life here and now. We will have everything promised to us because the world's beatitudes carry with it promises, carry with them promises also. If you want ambition to be the the sort of the fuel of your life, well, there's a good chance you'll get the payoff for that. You'll get to the top. That's it. Remember when Jesus was instructing people on how to pray and he was identifying the Pharisees, the religious leaders who would stand in the temple courts and pray loudly with all of their religious garb on and they sort of became a spectacle. They wanted everyone to see how holy they were. And Jesus says, rather than do it that way, when you pray, go into a closet where no one can see you, close the door and pray to your father in heaven who's always available to you. And then he goes on to say things like, don't let your left hand even know what your right hand is doing, okay? Don't don't practice your piety in public in order to get attention. And then he said, if you do that, 
you will get your reward. And the reward that you will get is simply attention from other people. But if that's all you want, and if that's all you think you need, then go ahead and live that way. The world does promise if you work hard and you step on and around everybody that's in your way and you look out for number one come hell or high water, there's a good chance you will get to the top. That's true. But that's your reward. What does it profit a man to gain a fortune and lose his soul? Jesus says. Who cares? about being on top if you have dehumanized people along the way. And in the process of dehumanizing people, you've dehumanized yourself. I mean, what happens to a, what happens to a soul when all you go for is what you want, what you need? You spend your life chasing after all of the things you think will make you happy, make you satisfied. You work hard to become lovable so that you'll get the love you crave. You work hard to become uh, this kind of person so you'll get this kind of payback. Um, well, the world has its own beatitudes, and it car- they carry with them their own promises. Um, these beatitudes are very, very different. What we see here is a very different kind of kingdom being described than the kingdom we're used to here and now. Um, My friend Ray Ortland did a really good job, I think, many years ago at a conference we hosted in his talk of um, sort of sharing the difference between what this world values and what God values. He said, when we want to start something... We recruit the cool people, the winners, the heavy hitters, the gifted, the rich, the smart, people who are funny and impressive. Jesus, on the other hand, looks for the losers who are down so low they need everything. Who would start a think tank with dropouts? Who would start a business with gamblers? Who would start a religion with sinners? Jesus. Very, very different. I read this quote yesterday from Philip Yancey, who, by the way, wrote a book called What's So Amazing About Grace that I think the women in our church will be studying soon, right, Kathy Peliquin? Philip Yancey is an amazing writer. He's a writer's writer. He's written a handful of best-selling books, uh, incredibly thoughtful, a gracious man. I had the privilege of sitting down with him one time for a couple of hours and just picking his brain as I was beginning my own writing career. Just picking the brain of an amazing writer was such a gift to me. Um, But in his book, Rumors of Another World, he says this, very much in line with what Ray Ortland said. He says, Jesus was the first world leader to inaugurate a kingdom with a heroic role for losers. He spoke to an audience raised on stories of wealthy patriarchs, strong kings, and victorious heroes. Much to their surprise, he honored, Jesus honored instead, people who have little value in the visible world, the poor and meek, the persecuted and those who mourn, social rejects the hungry and thirsty. His stories consistently featured the wrong people as heroes. The prodigal, not the responsible son. The good Samaritan, not the good Jew. Lazarus, not the rich man. The tax collector, not the Pharisee. The glory of the church is when she lays aside her respectability and her dignity and welcomes the outcasts. That's beautifully said. Jesus was the first, how did he say it? Jesus was the first world leader to inaugurate a kingdom with a heroic role for losers. Ironically, okay, and this was this this twist that I was wrestling with yesterday as I was studying this. It was sort of scarcely in the back of my brain, and then it sort of crystallized late in the afternoon. Um, But the irony of this passage is that what this entire sermon, Jesus is the most famous sermon ever preached, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. 
What this entire sermon goes on to show is that when we are measured up against God's standard of perfection, we are all outcasts and losers. It's not like there's a category of losers and a category of winners in God's economy. When measured against God's requirement to be perfect, we're all losers. We all fall short. Remember, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' sermon on the Ten Commandments. Okay, this is Jesus' authoritative interpretation of the Ten Commandments. And his goal in this sermon is to expose the fact that there are none righteous, no, not one, and that there is no one good but God. That's the goal of the Ten Commandments, and that's the goal of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' sermon on the Ten Commandments. To expose what the rest of the Bible says about us, that there is no one righteous, no, not one, that there is no one who does good but God. Um, so in other words, the Sermon on the Mount, this is so uh, stimulating to me, okay? The Sermon on the Mount levels us into becoming people who know that they're sinners, people who hunger for righteousness because they know they need it and don't have it, people who are poor in spirit, meek, and so on. To put it another way, the people described at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount are the kinds of people who are produced by the Sermon on the Mount, okay? Did you get that? Okay, I mean, I don't know about you. You guys are all staring at me like you don't know what I just said. That was like the most stimulating part of my study yesterday. Someone fake an amen at least. Uh, there you go. Thank you for faking it at my command. That's really good. Um, let me put it in a simpler way. God's law humbles us into becoming everything that the Beatitudes describe, okay? So the kinds of people that are described at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in the Beatitudes, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uh, the poor in spirit, so on and so forth, are the kinds of people that the rest of the sermon produces. So if you start off in the Sermon on the Mount, hi, I'm doing pretty good, I'm pretty strong, God is my co-pilot, but I have my hands on the wheel, I'm doing all right, uh, you know, so on and so forth. I'm not as bad as that guy. I'm not as bad as her. At least my marriage is stronger than theirs. Uh, you know, whatever the case may be, okay? My kids turned out better than his. My kids turned out better than hers. Um, you know, I may not be perfect, but I'm sure uh, better than that person over there who's really screwed up time and time again. I'm wise. They're foolish, blah, blah, blah. That's where a lot of people start. And what the Sermon on the Mount does is it systematically deconstructs you and exposes you as being more needy, more desperate, less righteous than you think you are. And when the Sermon on the Mount fully deconstructs you, when God's law deconstructs you, what ends up happening is, oh my gosh, you become a little bit more meek. You become more poor in spirit. You begin hungering and thirsting after righteousness because you know you don't have any. In other words, you become the kinds of people that the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount describes if you pay attention to the whole sermon. Uh, thank you, Ken. Thank you. That was, thank you very much. I don't know what I would do without you. Um, <laughs> um, so, in the Beatitudes, Jesus shows that God's kingdom is all about God giving and us receiving, not us accomplishing and God applauding. Okay, that's the big difference. Uh, we are the ones who desperately need God to do something for us. God is not the one who desperately needs us to do something for him. Huge difference between those two things. And most of what I grew up believing Christianity was all about was that God saves me, rescues me, raises me from death to life, and it was God's blood, sweat, and tears in the person of Jesus that got me in the door, but now it's my blood, sweat, and tears lived from this point forward that will keep God happy with me. Well, that's when we approach Christianity conditionally, and we think that if I, the better I am, the more God likes me. 
And the worse I am, the less God likes me. The more spiritual I can become, the more guaranteed I can be that God's love will come to me. And the less spiritual I am, or if I'm having a bad spiritual day, or if I'm just being selfish, I'm being a jerk to the people around me, well, I can be pretty assured at that point that God has turned his back on me until I get things right. Clean up my act. So on and so forth. That's the way most, you know, most of the people that I know who have rejected Christianity, that's what they're rejecting. I mean, that is what they're rejecting. I've never met a human being who, if I, without even mentioning Jesus or without even mentioning Christianity, if I say, listen, if there was an offer presented to you, an offer of a lifetime of never-ending forgiveness, unconditional love, full-blown acceptance and approval, so much so that you'll never have to seek the approval of another person the rest of your life, where all of your guilt can be removed, all of your shame can be wiped away, where all of your sins can be forgiven and forgotten forever, is that something you would buy? Most people would say, well, <laughs> of course. We all live with some level of guilt and shame and regret and loss and plaguing thoughts of things that we've done wrong or people that we've hurt. And I mean, we would love to wake up tomorrow morning with a clean slate. Well, let me say this. Um, every single one of us woke up this morning with something infinitely better than a clean slate. We woke up loved unconditionally by God in spite of our unclean slate. That's something so much better. Well, when you present Christianity that way, I've never met anybody that goes, well, I don't want, I don't want to be forgiven. It was a, I think it was Carl Jung, the secular psychologist, who once said famously, I could dismiss half of my patients tomorrow if I could just assure them that they were forgiven. We all live with a sense of guilt and shame and regret and so on and so forth. Well, when Christianity is presented as a clean up your act and get love from God, well, people reject that. I reject that. And if you're sane, you'll reject that. And you'll reject any place you hear that, whether it's explicitly stated or simply implied. When you hear... Well, may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them well and thousands more. My God, he knoweth none. That just sounds too good to be true. That the sins we can't forget, God doesn't remember. That all of our guilt and shame was nailed to an old rugged cross 2,000 years ago. So that when God looks at me, relates to me, sees me, he sees the perfect work of his son on my behalf. I mean, that's, that's good news. That's why the gospel's called good news. The gospel is not just do it. The gospel is it is finished, full stop. We need to hear just do it so that we can be reminded that we can't. And then once we come to the sobering realization that we can't, then we need to hear it is finished. Um, and so... The world rejects this sort of moralistic, do more, try harder, get better, or else kind of message, as they should. It's not Christianity. As we looked in the last series that we did, Irreligious, that's religion, not Christianity. Um, but in the Beatitudes, God shows us that God's kingdom, his love is all about him giving and us receiving not us accomplishing and God applauding, okay? Um, we are the ones, as I said, who desperately need God to do something for us. God is not the one who desperately needs us to do something for him. So everything this world values is turned upside down in God's economy of grace. In the Beatitudes... Uh, the way down is the way up, that to be low is to be high, that the broken heart is the healed heart, that to have nothing is to possess all, that to be weak is to be strong, that to give is to receive, that to be small is to be big, that to die is to live. It just doesn't make sense. God's economy of grace doesn't make sense. Um, but in his economy, only the sick are healed. 
Only the disgraced receive grace. Only the sinner is saved. Only the lost are found. Only the dead are made alive. And so deadness and lostness and being disgraced and sick and all of that stuff, that's, that's the stuff that God works with. That's the stuff. It's not the goodness and the cleanliness and how much stronger and better we are. And that, that God can't work with that stuff. What he works with is deadness, lostness, a sober realization that God is God and I am not. That he is strong, that I am weak. Um, and so it's the, it's the people who know they are impure who get grace, not the people who think they are pure. It's those who acknowledge their unrighteousness who get God's righteousness. The ones who get God's best, you could put it this way, the ones who get God's best are the ones who admit that they deserve only God's worst. Be merciful to me, O God, a sinner. That's who God, that's who Jesus in the temple courts points his disciples to and says, that guy, you know, when he points to the two guys, the one Pharisee, the one religious leader is praying in the temple courts and says, God, oh God, thank you that you didn't make me like that guy over there. And Jesus says, see that guy? Don't be like that, okay? He says, well, who should we be like? Look at that guy. And there's a guy over there in the corner who's just, you know, sort of on his knees, torn clothes, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, it's that guy who walks away justified, not that guy. It's the same story you've heard me tell over and over about the, pros the Pharisee, I mean, the prostitute busting into the Pharisee dinner party, wiping Jesus's feet or cleaning Jesus's feet with her tears and drying his feet with her hair. And the religious leader looks to his other religious leaders in the room and says, this guy has to be an imposter because no no self-respecting man of God would ever let a woman like this touch him. And Jesus says, I know what you're thinking. You got it backwards, dude. It, it, you think she needs to become more like you. I tell you, you actually need to become more like her. That's the kind of people, those are the kinds of people that... Um, God's law and sin and the reality of everyday life sort of beats us down to the place where we realize Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And when we get to that place, freedom, freedom, so much freedom. There is so much freedom. I mean, just think about this practically. When you know that God loves you unconditionally, you don't need everybody else to like you. <laughs> Okay? I mean, how much time and energy do we spend manufacturing an image in one way, shape, or form, not just externally, but internally, to try to get people to like us? It's exhausting. It's slavery. Real slavery, according to the Bible, is self-reliance, relying on myself to be for me and to get for me what only God can be and what only God can get. Um, so... Um, the ones who get God's best are not the, the strong... And the righteous, uh, the ones who get God's best are the ones who admit that they deserve only God's worst. The Beatitudes could be summed up like this, okay? This is counterintuitive, um, but true. What keeps us from knowing God is not the badness we know we have, but the goodness we think we have. That's what keeps us from knowing God. That's what prevents intimacy with God. Um, God meets us in the very places where we acknowledge our inadequacy and need. I mean, grace like water flows and gathers to the lowest point. So when you're feeling weak, desperate, I don't know about you, but in those seasons of my life where I have felt confident, in control, strong, like I have it all together. Those are the moments and the seasons where I feel most distant from God because I don't need him. I'm doing it. It's in those moments where I have felt weak, burnt out, beat up, at a loss, desperate, 
on my back where God shows up in a way that opens my eyes. What did Job say at the end of Job after he lost everything, lost everything, suffered in unimaginable ways? And he says, before my ears had heard of you, O God, but now my eyes have seen you. The path from hearing only to seeing is paved in suffering and difficulty and pain and desperation and all those things we spend a lifetime trying to avoid. It's amazing to me. No one asks for that stuff. We don't, we don't look for that stuff. We don't need to look for it. It's inside of us. It's on our front door. But we spend all of our time trying to either ignore it or avoid it or whatever. And it's in those, those are God's rendezvous points for us. Those are the places where he meets us, those very places where we acknowledge our inadequacy and our need. Now remember, okay, while it may be our strength and beauty and health that attract others to us, it is our weakness and dirtiness and sickness that attracts God to us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were at our worst, Paul says, God gave us his best. Um, let me conclude with this. Uh, I turned 49 a couple weeks ago. I know that I look 59, but I'm only 49. Uh, and it took 49 years, but I have finally reached a point in my life where I am totally okay saying that my life doesn't look like Jesus. My life looks like someone who needs Jesus. Okay. Okay. I'm okay with that. I'm okay saying that. I actually think God wants us to say that. And my prayer for all of you is that you come to that same realization because knowing this about ourselves, that our lives don't look like Jesus, our lives look like people who need Jesus, when you know this about yourself, it's, that's what paves the way for God's grace to sweep us off of our feet and set us free. As I just said, grace is like water. It it flows to the lowest point. Brennan Manning, another excellent writer who died a handful of years ago, put it this way. The gospel only sounds like good news to the bedraggled, the beat up, and the burnt out. It is for the sorely burdened who are still shifting the heavy suitcase from one hand to the other. It is for the wobbly and weak need who know they don't have it all together. It's for inconsistent, unsteady disciples whose cheese is falling off their cracker. It's for poor, weak, sinful men and women with hereditary faults and limited talents. It is for earthen vessels who shuffle along on feet of clay. It is for the bent and the bruised who feel that their lives are a grave disappointment to God. It is for honest disciples who admit that they are scalawags. I love that. You know, according to the religious people, Jesus did God all wrong. God was supposed to be for the good and the strong and the clean and the competent. And Jesus shows up and he embraces the exact opposite kinds of people. And they hated it. As I said a minute ago, they were convinced there's no way this guy could be who he says he is. Because God would never welcome and embrace the kinds of people that this guy's welcoming and embracing. Scalawags, weak people, bedraggled, beat up, burnt out people, desperate people. But over and over and over again, that's who we see God drawn to. And as I said a little bit ago, the truth of the matter is we are all those kinds of people. When Jesus says, I didn't come for the righteous person, I came for the sinner. I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. He wasn't saying, there are good people in this world who don't need me, and there are bad people in this world who do. I didn't come for the good people, I came for the bad people. That's not what he was saying. He was saying, there are two kinds of people in this world. There are bad people, bad and weak people who think they're good and strong, and there are bad and weak people who know that they're bad and weak. 
These are the ones that will hear my voice because they know their need. These won't pay any attention to me because they think they got it on their own. But you see, the food of the gospel tastes so much better when you're starving. So much better. The drink of God's mercy is so much more refreshing when you're dying of thirst. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What's the promise? For they shall be filled. Let's pray together.